Greetings. My name is Taufik Bakkali and I'm from the UNAIDS Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific and I'm pleased to join you today to discuss some reflections about the global aid strategy for 21-26 and discuss how it focuses on ending inequalities as a way towards ending AIDS. 40 years into the global AIDS response, we continue seeing improvements in the tools that we have with regard to the HIV response. We see improved drugs for treatment, improved tools and methods for prevention. We continue improving on our understanding on the epidemic dynamics and how these change over time. We learn from our successes and failures continuously. And normally we should expect that as time pass by, we need to uh, accelerate our pace towards achieving the goal of uh, ending the AIDS epidemic as a global, AIDS, uh, uh, a global health threat. Unfortunately, we are observing in recent years, um, as we are coming out of the period of the fast track strategy, that we are not going in the correct uh, path, in the right pace towards achieving those targets and the 2020 targets for the fast track strategy have not been met. So there was an opportunity and a need or saying a requirement that we again look back, um, accumulate some learnings and consider why have we um, have not um, uh, continued to be on track um, for achieving the, 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 the goals and targets. Some of the key learnings that have been um, observed at the time of developing or preparing the development of the global aid strategy is that um, there were several people continuously left behind or people who have remained in their own vulnerabilities, not being able to access HIV services or when they access, they remained in uh, a certain form of vulnerability that did not support them to continue accessing their, these services and take the benefits. So the, the new global strategy started by acknowledging the pressing challenges, uh, those failures, those issues, and the fact that um, there were many people who were not having equal chances for accessing the services for several reasons. Um, between the economic, the social, um, and also uh, policy related and design of services uh, as well. Um, and this is coming from the fact that um, the, um, or at least let's say, it recognizes the need to have an approach that is people centered, that would ensure that everyone benefits from the services and uh, recognize the need to remove all the social, the structural barriers that prevent people from accessing HIV services. And this reflects the spirit of ending inequalities. So the strategy in its design and its approach, it acknowledges the pressing challenges and opportunities, and it recognizes the key shifts that are needed to end. The strategy in its design does not only set up targets um, as benchmarks, but the design of those targets uh, would um, help us um, um, establish a framework or even develop a pathway towards achieving the, 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 the goals. So within that, um, there was a strong call on all governments, um, development and financing partners and communities, of course, and the UNAIDS, family to identify and address these inequalities because they are different. They establish themselves in different way for different populations. And those inequalities are not standard and are not similar everywhere and for all populations, which calls for a need to have um, different solutions for different populations that would help and serve their, their needs and requirements. Um, at the same time, this strategy is aligned to a decade of action and makes an explicit contribution to advance the goals and the targets across the 10, um, across 10 uh, SDGs. So, as we say, when we talk about the global aid strategy, um, there is always reference to its targets and each strategy is associated by its 
by the benchmark. So probably this will be called the strategy of the 95, 95, 95. Which again, we would need to reiterate that um, it's not only the treatment related strategies of 95, 95, 95, which is one of the targets. There are several uh, benchmark or several areas where those targets have been set at that level just to reflect the need to ensure that no one is left behind. But at the same time, we need to pay attention to the 10, 10, 10 targets, which are reflected in the, to the left side of the slide which are all about the enablers, um, um, ensuring that PLHIV and key populations do not experience stigma discrimination that hinder or deter them from accessing services, that uh, PLHIV, women and girls and key populations uh, um, do not experience gender-based inequalities and gender-based violence, and that also the punitive laws um, and policy and uh, restrictive policies are removed to facilitate that access. These are key conditions that are required to set uh, to facilitate the achievement of the 95. So there is a very strong link. But the way all these um, uh, targets have been designed are um, as um, and reflected in the strategy is through an approach of putting people living with HIV and the communities at risk at the center through a lens of um, through an inequalities lens by looking at options and solutions and methods um, for removing the different types of inequalities that these people um, are facing which do not allow them to access the services or receive the services that 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 they need so uh, again the strategy is not only a set of, be of benchmarks set at a very high level uh, for some indicators and very low level for some indicators but it also reflects a comprehensive combined approach on what would lead us um, towards achieving those targets by taking the learnings from the previous strategies and uh, why some people have been left behind and why the global targets and also regional targets um, in our case for Asia Pacific have, have not been met. But let's talk also about the political declaration which has uh, brought in a language that is more explicit about these uh, aspects of inequalities as the political declaration uh, adopted um, the, the strategy um, um, and uh, it included all the targets from the, this Global Aid Strategy and it features as well a, um, a series of bold milestones to be reached by 2025. Um, it reiterates the commitment to ending inequalities within and among countries as they reflect themselves for each category of the population. Um, it highlights the need to renew the commitments on the societal enablers, which we have just mentioned, because these aspects are really key um, when um, they are resolved or when these targets of 10, 10, 10 at least are being met, they facilitate the achievements of the 95, 95, 95. It reiterates a commitment on the proportion of HIV services to be delivered by community-led organizations, or in other words, the need for community leadership in the HIV response. It, it um, mentions a clear commitment um, to the elimination of HIV-related stigma and discrimination and to respect, protect and fulfill the human rights um, of people living with HIV. It um, reflects on um, combination prevention, use of innovations, um, scale up of innovative new uh, technologies and approaches and models of service delivery. As we all know, they are work by facilitating also um, the, their access and recognizing that they provide solutions to at least some categories of vulnerable populations. And of course, all this requires um, a commitment with regard to funding so that all these things take place. And there was there was specific language about the commitment to, um, to um, uh, funding uh, the global response using different um, sources. So I would like to reflect a little bit further uh, and um, by referring to some concrete examples or discuss some observed challenges and give some examples as we see them uh, 
um, um, also um, use uh, from the evidence that is available to us with regard to the situation of the epidemic in response in Asia and the Pacific. Um, and um, how these challenges reflect the existence of these uh, inequalities which justify why we missed the 2020 targets and the need to resolve them if we want to achieve the 25 targets um, or, uh, or beyond. So challenge number one is that uh, key populations, adolescents and women are still at a very high risk of HIV infections. As we see um, in this uh, donut um, in the right side uh, representing a global um, data, uh, we realize that adolescent girls and young women aged 15 to 24 um, account for 10% of the total population, but they make up 25% of all pale HIV. Um, 20, uh, key populations and their sexual partners account for 65% of HIV infections globally. But interesting to note that that's the variety and the specificity of regions is that in Asia Pacific, this share represents 94% of new infections that are happening among key populations and their sexual partners. And this tells us that who are the population that we need to um, work with. So as we see here in this slide, which presents more in detail, the donut uh, represents more in detail the situation of, of, for Asia and the Pacific, where 94% of all infection, new infections are happening among key populations and their partners, over half among uh, men who have sex with men. And we can see also the share of new infections related to sex work. Um, but it's interesting to associate this piece of information to the existing policy and laws that are prevalent in Asian Pacific regions, where all these populations, in a way or another, are being criminalized. Majority of countries criminalize sex work, um, criminalize uh, same-sex relations, um, detention and use of drugs is criminalized at different thresholds, and this in, uh, alone indicates the difficulties that we should expect with regard to implementing programs or even for these populations to feel comfortable to go out and seek the services and that they do require. Now, we do know that there are the laws in the books and the laws in the streets and that there are programs um, rolled out for key populations that have done results but that does not mean that we should forget about the existence of these policies and the risk and the vulnerability they create for these populations and putting them in a situation of inequality with regard to claiming rights, with regard to um, accessing services without fear, and with regard to enjoying um, all um, the rights um, for health um, and, uh, safe and for their own safety, let alone in the context of COVID, for example, and we'll talk about this later, um, being able to access uh, other benefits like social protection um, and, and so on. The other aspect that we are seeing is that, uh, um, unfortunately, most of these populations remain invisible and unaccounted for in most countries. This is data that is based on some analysis that um, we have done in UNAIDS um, with a number of experts and partners. Uh, and that is, this slide is specific to Asia and the Pacific. It just tells us a comparison between the total key population size estimate as reported formally by the countries versus the gap or the difference that is estimated as underestimate or that is considered as underestimate among the countries where data is reported. And the gray is reflecting uh, countries where no data is reported. So if we consider the total figures by key populations, men who have sex with men, female sex workers, transgender women, people who inject drugs, although there are some questions about, um, we have received some reactions about that specific slide because some community organizations consider that there is a, a much bigger, larger underestimate um, for people who inject drugs as well in this region. But regardless, it just tells us 
um, how many um, of these populations are not accounted for in the national strategies, they are not considered in target, they remain invisible, they are not counted, and of also um, they are not reflected in the denominators when, for example, a program performance is being reported. And when populations are not being considered, um, and they are not being considered for planning of program and service delivery, it tells us also that um, they remain, um, um, they face inequalities in at least having a chance to be able to access a service that would be available for them. So uh, when even budgeting for smaller size of the population is available, and uh, when there is possibly high demand, it creates um, also that uh, vulnerability and that inequality. Um, when people are not accounted for, they are forgotten and they remain facing their vulnerabilities. Challenge number two is that um, HIV services remain largely inaccessible for most vulnerable populations. Um, and this is an observation that is also related to the previous uh, challenge that we have seen when um, the data tells us that HIV prevention and testing services um, uh, coverage remain extremely low. Uh, and there are various reasons for that, um, from criminalization to harmful gender norms, other inequalities, stigma and discrimination, um, and so on. Uh, and also inadequacy of models of service delivery of the approaches and the lack, the lack of options and choices in the package um, of services um, keep people away or does not meet the needs of the population. So, and it reflects on um, very small rates um, of prevention access. Now, this region, Asia the Pacific, um, is the region where key population focused programs have been designed and started and scaled up. But even at this stage, 40 years into the AIDS response, and we understand very well that this is a concentrated epidemic focusing mostly on these populations, and yet we could not find the solutions uh, to increase the performance with regard to access to prevention and testing services. And that is because of an inadequate policies, inadequate models of service delivery, um, uh, which do not respond to the needs of this population and you know, um, let us observe in these things. Now, this also reflects the reason why we could not achieve this uh, as a stronger trend of decline of HIV new infections. But that tells us the need to probably look further on the why and what is happening. And even within key, each key population, what is happening and why some access and, and many do not access services. If we take the example here for young people, just let take, let's take age as a factor determining inequalities. And we do know in several countries, the infections among young people 15 to 24 represent a substantial size, a substantial share of new infections. Um, we also see, we don't have this slide here, this data here, but we see that several countries have a sharp increase of incidence among young people. Um, even though the national trend is going down, the trend among young people is uh, increasing in several countries. We see this evidence and it is well known and it is um, widely available. We match this to the existing policies, um, although the age groups are not matching here, but we, uh, that's an example to explain the in inadequacy of the existing policies um, that maintain some populations that we know are vulnerable, they, uh, those policies keep them in their vulnerabilities and deny them access to, treat, uh, to services. And the example here is the, that pie chart that reflects the need and the requirements of parental consent, for example, for young people aged uh, below 20. Um, depending on the, the, the countries. Yes, we have several countries who do not require parental consent, and this is improving mostly in recent years. 
when um, the initiatives around the Yankee populations have started to be rolled out and all that stroke advocacy. But we do have many countries who still impose those forms of uh, requirements, um, which means simply that these people cannot access services. At the end, this translates into data that we see in the right side of the slide, where uh, if you compare the young populations within each key population category, you compare the young ones access to services, testing, for example, as compared to the older ones, you see the huge difference. The inequality here is reflected through the age, but the reason of the inequality is the policies and the inadequacy of service delivery. Imagine if we think as a solution um, of youth-friendly services that are being rolled out and that do not require a specific um, um, you know, consent or parental consent for these young people who we know are vulnerable and constitute a large share of our infections. If we have this solution, probably we would not be seeing that the young people in any country um, have three uh, times lower level of um, status knowledge as compared to their older, uh, older peers within each category of populations, which um, reflects that level of inequalities that do exist from within populations and how this translates and what, what makes those inequalities um, happen. The other solution is thinking of a combination of services that might serve the needs of different populations. We do not have a bullet model of service delivery and a bullet approach or a prevention method that would work for all because the vulnerabilities of different populations are different. We know from very long back that combination of services is the key and the solution. Now, when we start analyzing the evidence before us about the countries who have sufficient combination, unfortunately, we do not see much. There is some recent movement uh, several countries in across all the countries in Asia Pacific have adopted community based HIV testing, but there is a lot more and those lot more tend to be probably in some instances more uh, have uh, more effective uh, reach out the those that are very likely to remain unreached through uh, traditional methods. Unfortunately, this, these are not rolled out sufficiently and we see very few countries are adopting them. When we talk about uh, social or online network based testing, HIV self testing, for example, this is a, uh, a slide about testing lay provider. Again, that, that tells us the difference between the 8% and 71% tells us that we do not have that combination of approaches and models adopted widely enough to allow for a strong increase of HIV uh, of HIV services uptake as reflected here in the example of HIV testing and this is why when we see some countries achieving very well and probably those are the countries who are having um, you know uh, that uh, uh, good combination of options we remain regionally at the median level of around 50% um, um, uh, coverage of those services, which is not sufficient if we want to catch up on the HIV epidemic and treatment. Challenge three, COVID. COVID has come and it has created uh, large disruptions um, to the HIV response. People living with HIV have higher risks of COVID, as we know. Um, serv HIV services or AIDS related services were forced to interrupt. Um, testing declined, rollout of treatment declined. We have evidence globally reported by the country and we see even when we there was a, a monitoring specific period on when COVID hit, we do realize that the uptake on treatment and testing um, have um, um, seen serious disruptions. Um, and also COVID-19 aggravates inequalities because of the lockdowns, because of the constraints on movement and uh, things. It exposes the inadequacy of the public health investments, particularly as the health system um, has been diverted to respond to COVID. We have seen threatening on the livelihoods of key populations. 
increased violence against women, increased vulnerability, which means strengthening and um, um, amplifying the existing uh, or even revealing the existing inequalities. At the same time, we have seen great solutions uh, on initiatives of community networks and community organizations um, to design and implement services that manage to overcome um, those restrictions uh, that have been observed. So the global strategy talks about also about an approach to build resilience and um, build uh, pandemic preparedness. And it reflects on these five elements um, on um, HIV, for HIV and pandemic response and that builds re resilience and make sure that we do not lose on the gains. These are reflected through um, a focus on community-led and community-based services, service delivery, and we have seen how communities have taken up a strong role in ensuring that, for example, people living with HIV continue receiving their drugs at home or prevention um, uh, or even OST. We have seen also uh, uh, psychosocial support provided by communities. Um, so many good examples have been documented in the World AIDS Report um, uh, as local initiatives that helped save some of the gains of the global AIDS response. Um, second element, equitable access to health products, supporting frontline workers because, you know, all the front load, uh, all the load that uh, happens on them. Um, and here we talk about frontline workers, both community and health. Um, then uh, we talk about human rights, keeping human rights as the center for the all approach to uh, HIV and pandemic response. And of course, we need the data system that keeps telling us the existence um, on inequalities and how they get amplified or affected uh, by the existence of pandemics. One of them is HIV and uh, finding a way to address those inequalities would help us respond, um, find a way to respond to the pandemic. Looking at uh, where we are on HIV treatment, we realize that, you know, the pace of growth is extremely slow. Comparing 2019 to 2020, we did not improve much. It looks a little bit on number, but that improvement is of uh, a two uh, percent points um, in each of um, the 1990-90 cascade uh, tells us that we are not getting um, fast enough. Unfortunately, with COVID, we have realized that the pace has seriously slowed down for the period 2019-20, where COVID had started, when we were at around 14% uh, catching up, um, a net increase on people receiving treatment. That period um, of COVID, we have seen only 5%. We looked more in detail in countries, and it was uh, worrying to see that several countries are even going backward. Um, reflected in red, meaning the gap of the 90s is widening. We have a number of countries who either have met the global targets of the 90s or are still continuing to close in the gap. But when you look at 50% are either have see the gap widening or not changing uh, for the first 90 or I think it's about 70% or 65%. For the second 90, it's a source of worry. And it tells us that we need to consider the learnings and recommendations of the global strategy that tells us that we need to find solutions to make sure that we preserve the gains. And that's by uh, working on a stronger role for communities, community leadership, and finding solutions to reduce uh, inequalities. It's interesting to say that we have this at the time when several countries have a very large buffer of people who know status but not yet rolled out on treatment. You would imagine that in this situation when testing might have slowed down, it should be possible to continue the improvement on rollout on treatment. Unfortunately, we did not see that. But this graph, this slide in itself, it tells us that there are serious inadequacies in the design of service delivery of a program when there is a lot of efforts being done uh, to reach populations, test, identify HIV positive, but a very large proportion of them is not linked to treatment, even when we have policies. So the green squares that we see on top of the bars,
reflects that we have a policy that allows for same day HIV, uh, same day treatment as diagnosis, but it's not implemented. The large gap reflects that there is some issues of design of service delivery that requires to be looked at. Challenge four is that solution, solutions for innovative um, and effective interventions are not scaled up um, um, uh, enough and not scaled up rapid, uh, rapidly enough as required so that we can catch up. It is reflected by evidence we see among uh, uh, on treatments, for example, uh, on a rollout of PrEP, despite the strong commitment and several countries decided to roll out PrEP um, um, uh, at national level, uh, still the numbers regionally are uh, very slow and it is not improving to a level that would have an impact on the epidemic. And same thing for all other innovative solutions of service delivery, including the online, including um, uh, several other uh, approaches um, that turn out locally to be extremely effective, but are not scaled up um, widely. Now, I'd like to discuss and share an example from Cambodia. And we all know that Cambodia has achieved the second and third 90 and almost achieved the first 90, um, or they might have achieved it already. And uh, we would expect that at, level, at that level, we would face difficulties in finding more paid HIV, um, and that requires innovative approaches to find the most recent infections and roll them out on treatment. Uh, so uh, there was a, an, a, an attempt to strengthen on the treatment side by rolling out same day ART to the maximum facilities and the scale up had been very rapid even at the time of COVID. Um, multi-month spending to keep people on treatment and avoid disruption and discontinuation on treatment um, rolled out very quickly. But what is important to note is what is in the left side is initiatives being developed um, to use um, um, testing through virtual outreach for men who have sex with men and transgender. And this have to, is to me given amazing results when, first of all, the, the outer circle reflects the increase in HIV testing for that population through virtual outreach. COVID time probably have helped, but an 89% increase reflects a very rapid, uh, and this is a comparison between six months. Uh, I'm saying that this reflects a very rapid uptake because there are there is demand. There are population who are acting mostly online, uh, finding sexual partners um, and uh, engaging in, in risk. And um, with even COVID lockdown, they remained mostly online and not going to the, you know, the venues where they are more likely to be reached through traditional methods. Interestingly, a very large share um, of those people who have accessed testing uh, are first ever tested. Testers have never accessed um, testing uh, services before. And a very high yield um, of HIV positivity. We see this among MSM and we see it among transgender. This is to me amazing. It shows that there had been some population which is not visible and has not been accessing services and there were no service model designed to reach them in the past. The moment it has been tried and established, you realize how much vulnerability is there in terms of HIV positivity. Um, extremely high um, um, yield of positivity, which means that we can, even when we have um, a very high coverage uh, in the 1990-1990 cascade, we can achieve the uh, further and move ahead very quickly in terms of going forward to achieve the 95, 95, 95, and even go beyond the, uh, as long as we use innovative approaches that help us reach people who face specific inequalities um, towards reaching services. So this is the spirit of the global aid strategy. It reflects the investment on the services, on the systems, including community and health, um, uh, um, and uh, etc. Et 
and it reflects the investment on the enablers, as we have discussed, including human rights, the policies, the stigma and discrimination, uh, and and um, all these aspects. All this combination of working on, com on systems, services, and enablers has to be approached through a model of working on applying an inequality lens. All this is designed in a way that would help us identify who are remain unreached, what are the blockages that create their inequality or their vulnerability, and why, uh, and how, what is the solution that helps resolve um, their access uh, to, uh, to services. And again, the, the numerical targets as reflected here in the strategy are only a benchmark that help us um, um, uh, reflect uh, not only the level what that we need to achieve but the combination tells us also the how we are going to achieve those targets lastly um, i would like to mention that the global strategy um, in its own design has considered that if achieved and if met it would help us within five years achieve an 83% decline of new HIV infections and a 78% decline of uh, AIDS related death, which is, you know, leading us towards the goal of ending AIDS and uh, breaching and going towards zero uh, new infections, new the virtual zero of new infections and new AIDS deaths. Lastly, as I finish this presentation, I would like to uh, remind ourselves that uh, the achievement of the new global aid strategy is possible. Many people have asked questions on whether it is just aspirational or those targets are inspirational um, or achievable. We have seen results, we have seen indications that countries who are very close to achieve it are still finding solutions to move forward. It takes that we take the strategy in its comprehensiveness, in all its components, all its elements, and uh, apply its principles uh, for focusing on uh, inequalities to find solutions that would um, um, facilitate for all vulnerable populations access the services that prevent them from infections or prevent them, prevent them from uh, deaths and save their lives. So thank you for uh, your attention.